Hi, good evening, all. This is Vishal Singhal from Sales Chat, your host for today. So we have uh, Mr. Intaljit Kar. He's Chief Architect and Head of AI from Simmons Adventure. He works in uh, lots in uh, uh, medical domain and deep learning. So he will take us through the topic today: computer vision and vision uncertainty in medical imaging. So you can ask the questions in between uh, through chat or question panel, and uh, I'll be asking him the same uh, through chat option, and he will be uh, answering those questions uh, from time to time. Otherwise, uh, if you can save your questions towards the end, for, for the end, that will be best for in, in uh, benefit. So go ahead, uh, Indrajit, over to you. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Vishal. Um, so thank you for having me. Uh, so just to introduce myself, uh, I work with Siemens Advanta, uh, that is part of Siemens Technology and Services uh, located in Electronic City. And I head the Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning and Advanced Analytics Division. Um, so basically what we do is we have uh, uh, from medical systems to non-medical systems to manufacturing to mobility to any, any kind of uh, I, I would say uh, domain uh, we give solutions to and uh, uh, mostly I am focused on computer vision and natural language processing I have uh, six patents in my name in, in terms of natural language processing computer vision and adversarial machine learning so uh, I also I am a 40 under 40 data scientist awardee uh, for 2020. I got that award from Analytic Media Magazine. So that's in short. Um, so let, let me get started. And um, so to start with, let me uh, tell you or uh, introduce you uh, to everyone. Just give me one minute, I think. OK, yeah. Can you see the screen, uh, Vishal? Okay, so what are the computer vision tasks that's prevalent these days? Uh, as you can see, uh, most of the chunk of the work that is being happening is uh, image classification. Then comes quantization. A lot of work is happening in object detection space, uh, object recognition. Then there is a uh, there is a you know a unique area called domain adaptation. So I just want to touch upon why what is this domain adaptation? Let's say I have a medical image on a Siemens um, uh, you know Siemens system, or I've got a medical image from a Siemens system. There is a domain shift that happens when uh, it moves to a Bosch system. Or I'll put you in a non-medical sense. If I have a camera which belongs to Kodak and I have got a Samsung camera or an iPhone camera, I've taken pictures, so there, there is a domain shift that is that happens. That's one kind of domain adaptation that given one image, the image will be able to adapt to any domains. That, that, so that's, that's very prevalent in uh, medical imaging because we see a lot of issues with the diacom images that we get if it comes from various uh i, I would say various uh, domains in th this way uh, apart from that what else is happening is model compression a lot of work is happening in facial recognition and there are other various tasks like generative uh, imaging attention various other research things that's happening so the takeaway from this slide is I wanted to give you an overall understanding how it is, uh, how it's spread. Moving on, um, so what are the usual computer vision tasks that we are involved in? Mostly, as I said, classification, segmentation, and object detection, instant segmentation. So now not every uh, image or every computer vision task is classification. Also, not every computer vision tasks or uh, is a segment, seg semantic segmentation. So these are the various, uh, you know, uh, uh, tasks that are happening these days. And there is one more which is uh, has come up a lot. Now this is called uh, panotopic 
segmentation. So what it does is panoptic segmentation. What it does is takes the semantic segmentation uh, that is assigning the class labels, and also it takes in the instance segmentation. It uses both of these mechanism, and there is a new uh, area which is called uh, panoptic segmentation. And uh, if, if I tell you guys that uh, Google, Facebook are heavily using these kind of segmentation to go ahead and uh, you know on their platforms. Now, one thing we need to understand: not only Google, Facebook, it's very prevalent in uh, medical imaging as well. As you can see, uh, the on the left hand side there is an uh, image, which is original image. A semantic segmentation has been done. Once the semantic segmentation has been done, there is also instance segmentation, which is nothing but detect and segment each object in instances. Then there is a panoptic segmentation. So th 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 this is also very useful, which combines both of them. And this is very, uh, it it's coming up. It it's there and it's coming up. A lot of people are doing a lot of research on it and various like from brain tumors to, um, I would say, uh, cardiothoracic uh, region segmentation. A lot of things are happening with this panoptic segmentation. Moving on, uh, so so let let me understand why is this uncertainty? Why is Indraji today and trying to explain us uncertainty in medical imaging? Is accuracy not enough or precision recall IOU? Uh, these metrics are they not enough to go ahead and judge? Well. Let me take you through this. All this that you that I just mentioned uh, is that you know is about uh, I, I I would say that it's about point estimate. So when I say when I get a point estimate, I get or I, I what I'm not able to do is uh, the quality of the output I am not able to assess. Uh, just to stop and answer. Uh, the question that what is the purpose of an optic segmentation now it one thing is i don't have to do an instant segmentation and i don't have to do a semantic segmentation separately i can do it in one go so that's one of the biggest benefit it has a computational benefit as well because i'm not running two models separately and getting outputs so that's one of the benefit to answer the question um so coming back to why uh, so as I said, that we, the quality of the output is not accurately measured using if I go ahead with point estimate. So uh, let me see. Uh, not only that, I have to go ahead and give a confidence to my clinical people, or let's say I am a data scientist. I have developed an algorithm, uh, image-based algorithm, and uh, now my, usually. Uh, you know, in the real world, people who are like operators, let's say I will say a, 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 a person who uses a, a, a chest x-ray or a radiologist uh, is used to see, you know, see the you know x-ray plates and take decisions. Trust me, it's very hard for and these are operators for for them to change or shift to a new environment. See, we humans are not okay to changes. To let me be very frank. So, when you're trying to push this kind of algorithm in a healthcare environment, it becomes very difficult. So, how will these people get confidence? They don't know about precision recall, or all these things. So, how will they confidence? This is this uncertainty estimation is one of the ways that I can go ahead and give confidence to my clinical or I, I'll say that, hey, see, this is what my image, this is the image you gave me. The model, the arithmetic model is sure about these, these regions, and it's not sure about these, these regions. Now then uh, the question is, why should I use if it's not sure? That's where you gain trust that say, hey, your uh, experience is not wasted. See, our models are not 100%. So that's where we need a collaboration between this radiologist, these operators 
and or in a way pathologist who is doing a histopathology examination these people and the ml it is they have to come together and do the collaboration work this uncertainty will enable that and if you are a uh, you know person who is doing or who is a business guy who is trying to propose a solution one of the things that usually people they ask me why should i use my solution first definitely yeah, i understand there is um the potential uh, you know uh, hours that will be saved but how will my technicians my operators get confidence how can you involve them in this decision making so this is one of the way give the uncertainties take out the uncertainties tell the technician come get your expertise together let's go ahead and give a solution so this is a very important this is called human in the loop uncertainty estimation can help human in the loop so moving on uh, i was going back that why this point estimates uh, it's it's not in uh, it's not right i'll come to that i'll explain in my later slide why point estimates has a lot of issues uh, apart from these uh, this i will say non uh, uh, this um, un, 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 without uncertainty in the models which are without uncertainty they have few issues what are the issues generalization issue that's why i spoke about domain adaptation so it, if you have a non domain adapted algorithm or a model this there will be a generalization issue let me give a very basic uh, you know example that i have trained an image on day and uh, i i want to predict the night version of the image that also is a domain adaptation so the model will not be able to understand so that's one of the issues that we get and there are other generalization issues that we all know about i'll come to them uh, shortly but one another thing is model getting overfitted so the model learns to memorize that you know given this feature this is always this but that's not the case secondly if suddenly uh, i give you out of distribution uh, see the, all this so, so let me take a step back Let, let's say that these images these images are what these images are numbers and when i say numbers they, they form a distribution they have a certain distribution now if uh, uh, you know, mostly when I say this, uh, non-uncertainty based models uh, are not okay with out of distribution samples. They tend to go ahead and, uh, you know, misclassify and not predict properly. And now you understand we are, uh, let's say we are in a medical field. I have a, um, you know, a, a patient who is suffering from some kind of a disease. Uh, which I am trying to understand through an image and probably predict what is the propensity of that particular disease. If I do a incorrect prediction, it can cost life. So that's where this uncertainty estimate is very important. And when it comes to medical imaging is much more important. So therefore I would say, that is not sufficient just to depend on classification and regression scores as i started my slide with we have to come and say what we have to come up with these uncertainties moving on uh, let me give you this example that you know this uh, this is a dl based algorithm uh, and this is exactly how an uncertainty, uncertainty estimate is calculated where on the bottom of the screen if you see that you know uh, the, 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 the there is a the, the, the red area these are the areas or the pixel probably are the pixels which are not certain so so as i said you know uncertainty is is, is the is the same way how a doctor expresses ambiguity like hey i am really not sure i need to run xyz test on you probably a blood test probably xyz tests and then i have to come to a conclusion this uncertainty is similar to that and what are these tests how can we do that we get a human in the loop and try to do that or probably go ahead and take this uh, you know uh, uh, it, 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 we have to inspect and understand the correlations uh, in the images so that's one of the ways we can go ahead and uh, work with the uncertainties i'll come to those uncertainty quantification and all those things later 
Let me give another example. This um, colorectal polyp. Say colorectal polyp is very dangerous, and you know it's a precursor of cancer. Uh, and it's very important that we detect it early, uh, because late detection doesn't help, as you all know, in uh, cancer uh, detection. So what we need over here it's not only i want my algorithm to be precise i want a couple of other things as well what are the additional things i want it to be i want it to interpret over here i want that interpretability or explainability i want that as well as i want uncertainties in the images so these given these two uh, if I am, um, let's say it goes to a radiologist or the experts where you can get human in the loop, they will be able to go ahead and take the further judgment. See, it's not only AI can solve all the problems. You have to get people who are expertise and get them involved. So that's the main thing. And as you can see that there are various ways to detect this uncertainty because uh, there are, I, I came across around 120 ways, more than 120 plus right now, how you can actually take out the uncertainties using deep neural networks. So as you see over here, we can do it using unit, which is most commonly used in segmentation. There is something called a segnet, uh, which also then there is an FCN as well. So these are the prevalent uh, neural networks that are used to go ahead and uh, no, get the uncertainty on an image. Just to shift a little gear, these are medical images, well and good, but what happens, let's say if I have a self-driving car and it's not image, those are video, can I do, can I understand the uncertainty, uncertainties? It's very important uh, to understand uncertainties in the videos as well. So not only images, you can, if I go back to um, a video where I am taking a 3D video of my cardiothoracic region and I am trying to understand uh, a 3D image, there are 3D uncertainties as well, which are available to uh, where, you know, the, 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 it can segment and from the segmentation and from the classification, it can take out the uncertainty. So moving on, let's understand, I know everybody over here probably might know about neural network, but let's understand how a neural net, what is this neural network? Basically, when I present to uh, the CXOs, what I say that you have an image which gets converted into numbers, the numbers get, get uh, you know, get addition, subtraction, multiplication happens with a bunch of other numbers which each is your model and there is another output which is again a number and that's 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 how the neural network works but but let me explain a little on uh, how it works in a mathematical way so given a data set x and y where x goes from a, a which is a which is a feature input or data input from x to xn uh, we have for, for um, classification let's say it's uh, there are labels which is from Y to YN. And also these are real numbers and a D-dimensional input vector, which has class labels from I to C. We, this, these are IIDs. And then we do get an approx approximation function, which approximates this Y. So this is all what is happening in a neural network. And uh, the same thing, if it's, a, if, there, if it's a regression, there will be no classes. It's, it's a continuous output or a continuous distribution. So that's all it's happening. Let's move a little bit more inside and understand that, you know, um, what is, uh, how do these networks they learn? So basically what they are doing over here is Given uh, the data, as I explained there for regression, it's probably a Gaussian distribution and another is a categorical distribution. Now, what we are trying to do over here is that these data sets learns the functional parameter W. Now, this W, the goal here is to learn the network parameter using a likelihood function. So what we are trying to do is maximize the likelihood of probably a class for a classification. So we are going to maximize the probability and uh, that's how we call it MLE and that's that's the, that's the how it learns. So this is uh, what we are doing from mathematical notation that an argmax uh, of 
uh, probability given the weights our data uh, we are predicting data and then we take a log of it and this is this is the r max of weight so now what are we optimizing or let's say what are we minimizing over so we are minimizing negative log likelihood so we, that is the goal in classification which is nothing but a cross entropy error so we have to minimize basically what i am saying is i don't like the negative log likelihood or a class i should always uh, you know uh, i want my probability score much bigger and i want to uh, minimize negative log likelihood and that is the cross entropy loss and for a regression that would be a sum of error or uh, you know least square error like that now there is a problem with uh, this uh, maximizing uh, mle uh, uh, as i can see what is the problem mle becomes overfitted now i will tell you guys how is it related because it's i'm going into a neural network how is it related as we all know what is underfitting as you can see on the left hand side it is underfitting on the right hand side is the overfitting so emily has a severe overfitting issue uh, so it gets overfitted very well but can i uh, go ahead and correct that overfitting absolutely so there where it comes in a bayesian theorem so let's understand this bayesian theorem what we are doing over here is uh, we are com uh, compute computing the map or uh, maximizing a priori what we are doing over here at likelihood we are multiplying with a priori and we are maximizing this and this has a regularization uh, you know uh, effect okay so what is this map says mle plus a regularization from the log prior so that that's that's a little bit over here now understand this this both mle and map gives out what point estimate of the parameters so that's going back to slide number 5 point estimate so what is this point estimate i will so this is the main thing why uh, we need uh, this uncertainty why need to calculate uncertainty and not just you know this score or scores or uh, you know classification or regression score is because of this this guy mle guy mle and map their point estimate so that's the base of it uh, so what is this point estimate? So we this, going back to stats. Uh, so on the as you can see, we have point estimate as x, a confidence interval, margin of error, and to visually understand difference between a point estimate and confidence in, confidence uh, interval estimate. So it's kind of uh, interval is kind of a range you can say uh and uh it's, it's a single point number so that's the difference so this uh statistics one-on-one -on -one. so as i said flash back to slide number five that why point estimate is not good because of the you know it, it, there are a lot of issues and in reality as you can see it's it's a normalized network output for a given class related to the other classes so just i'm just reading this out so what can be done so what can be done over here so let, let me before even what can be done let's understand how else can we uh, enable regularization so there are various ways in neural network that we do we do uh, activity regularization weight constraint dropout hold on to the dropout i will come to that a little bit later then uh, noise or early stopping you know adding statistical noise to it so these these how i can regularize or I can build a Bayesian neural network. So now we are coming into Bayesian, which I will tell you how it is related to uncertainty. So what is the Bayesian neural network? Let's understand a little about Bayesian neural network. So from a regression, let's say these are this is my input. I multiply with the weight and bias. I get an output. A Bayesian neural net or a Bayesian. When I say let's a Bayesian is nothing but the distributed weight or i get a distribution of weights instead of a point estimate i get a distribution of weight so the same thing happens for classification as well so th this is a distribution so let, let's understand a Bayesian neural network a little bit more uh, over here 
Uh, so as, as you can see, this weights in neural network are uh, random variables instead of fixed parameters that I just mentioned. So what we are doing, let's let's assume that we place a, uh, you know, a prior distribution over the weights and biases of the neural network and the result we get is a posterior predictors distribution. Now, under, now, there is one thing that uh, you know. To I will just shift a little gear that this this uh, uh, posterior predictive uh, or predictive distribution, it's it's uh, it's very difficult to uh, uh, you know what do you say? Um, uh, it's very difficult to calculate or optimize. So what do we do? We what we do? I'll tell you that later. It's there's something called a KL divergence. I'll come to that. But let me understand why this Bayesian neural network. So you said, Indrajit, that it's it's you know we cannot rely on point estimate. There are various regularization techniques, and now you gave us Bayesian neural network. So so why do I have to use Bayesian neural network? So because why Bayesian neural network is as previously I was referring to that MLE and MAP are point estimate, and this gives a a uh, weight, uh, weighted uncertainty gets accounted. So when I, when you go ahead and give a distribution instead of a point estimate, what happens is you are actually accounting for the uncertainties. From that, you take out the uncertainties and we do the, all those visualizations. Now, uh, and it has a very good resistance to overfitting. So uh, it's a very controversial statement uh, uh, because I was going to one of uh, the, the father of Bayesian neural network says that we do not need a validation data set to go and do a cross validation for if, if we build a Bayesian neural network. So th that means a cross validation is not required. Why is this not required over here is because see anyways you are getting a distribution probably that the the distribution or uh, the of the cross validation data set that we uh, validate our neural network in to reduce the overfitting is already there so that is the one of the reasons that you know we do not need a cross validation data set is not a very controversial statement but that's where the frequentist and bayesian they always uh, you know i would say they go in parallel not against each other but they go in parallel so to shift gear, a Bayesian all good, but as I was telling you guys previously, that there is a problem in uh, you know this this uh, this this uh, posterior distribution. What is the pro problem here? The problem is, uh, as I said, an analytical solution for this posterior distribution is intractable. So this is where something we need to understand that you know how to resolve this is using an approximation so if you guys everyone is aware of something called a variational inference which i'm going to talk now to what variational inference is doing or how do we do this approximation is by a kl divergence so what is this kl divergence remember the posterior distribution that i spoke about as it's not intractable what we are doing we're getting a variational distribution and then we are trying to minimize the distance between the posterior and the uh, variational distribution so how do we minimize it there is something called an elbow e l b o w not our elbow but there is an elbow which we maximize so let's not go there but just remember this um, so th th that's how we do approximation and that is called variational inference our models like uh, bae somewhere uh, or uh, variation uh, encoder decoder these models they use sometimes they use this scale divergence and the 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 learning that happens is uh, happens due to a reparameterization trick so uh, that, that that's a good to know thing so here is the cost function which is also called a variational free energy so i'm not going to explain this much because it goes to a complete different topic now as i said it inherits the uncertainty or we account the uncertainty uncertain not inherit account the uncertainty uh, so what we are doing over here let's understand what are these uncertainties 
So we have been talking about uncertainty and uncertainty. There are a lot of uncertainties over here. Basically, there are two types. And the first thing, which is a aleatoric uncertainty. So here is the so aleatoric uncertainty. As I said, we uh, to, to shift gear that it comes from the data. Uh, when we do regression, uh, one one of the things that we need to understand is how is the uh, you know spread of our residuals. Is it a homoscedastic or is it a heteroscedastic? So just to go, uh, so what is homoscedasticity and heteroscedasticity over here? Heteroscedasticity, you see a spread. It's spreading over here, okay? And homo is a, it's a constant spread. So it's a conditional. So uh, another way of saying that heteroscedastic is like in, seen in given a point Y, uh, what is the spread in, the, in that particular time? So it's kind of a conditional and this is a constant. So to come back, aleatoric is uh, sorry, yeah, aleatoric is mostly due to the data, and it is uh, it cannot be reduced that easily. So it's not that it cannot be reduced at all. It can be reduced unless uh, you know unless it's uh, we have to observe all the explanatory variables. So that's called aleatoric. Uh, you know, and uh, the, the, it comes from the labels, comes from the heteroscedastic, homoscedastic, and uh, it, it, it leads to uh, it leads to high uncertainties. So that's one. Second thing is the uncertainty from the model itself, which is epistemic uncertainty. So what is this epistemic uncertainty doing over here? It, it, it is it, it, now how do let's 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 get into that. How do you go ahead and reduce this epistemic uncertainty? That's why we say neural networks are data hungry. We keep giving them data. This epistemic uncertainty will reduce. So that's that's the types of uncertainty. Are there any other uncertainties? Yes, of course. So there are other uncertainties as well. As I already said, data label data aggregation uncertainty, pre-processing uncertainty, time interval uncertainty, visual aggregated uncertainty. So there are very, various uncertainties. Somehow or the other, they are related to these two. So these are related to these two. Now, um, let me uh, you know say that there are various ways that we can go ahead and quantify uh, quant uh, or quantify. So what is quantification of uncertainty? Uncertainty is where we try to reduce the uncertainties. So I told you to hold on to that dropout because I am going to tell you about a dropout. So one of the methods that we usually use um, is uh, using the Bayesian network is a Monte Carlo sample uh, from using uh, a trained dropout using Monte Carlo sample. Now can I actually go ahead and not use this uh, this mechanism can i do something else with my frequentist models which are not bayesian of course why not do in an ensemble uh, so what what happens in ensemble is it the, the there are various models it learns various dis distribution of features and somehow we can go ahead and uh, you know, you know, work on the uncertainty part, or the the uncertainty is minimized using an ensemble. But you understand one thing. Let's say I am doing an edge deployment. I have a let's say an iPad, and I'm going to go ahead and take images of or medical images of certain uh, you know certain visual images, and I'm going to uh, deploy the model on my iPad the hypothetical scenario and i will take pictures and go for some kind of predict prediction how much can i put how many ensembles or uh, machine learning or deep learning algorithms can i ensemble not many so there when we go ahead and use uh this bayesian neural uh, networks where we can have one neural network which does this now it's very difficult to train. Let me tell you that it's very difficult to train Bayesian neural networks. So what do I do? Is there a way to approximate Bayesian neural network? Yes, there is 
a way to approximate Bayesian neural network. That's another way. So what we do is we take a frequentist or a point estimate. We go ahead and batch use batch normalization, layer normalizations, and then we go ahead and uh, you know uh, you this mechanism we go ahead and use to quantify uncertainty. So this is a very well known mechanism where usually neural network it's what it's doing it's approximating a function here we are approximate the bayesian model itself uh, by a batch normalization so yeah it's it's a lot of people are doing this research and it's it's very helpful by this mechanism is very helpful um moving on as i already said as uh, assembling large models if if you have let's a gpu um and or not a gpu i'll say a server where i can take a lot of ensemble models store them and then probably this uncertainty minimization will happen and you, you your model will be much more robust uh, for medical imaging um lastly uh, okay i think i have cut, uh, you know uh, covered this already so I wanted to also cover there is something called a segnet and a unit, but I think to uh, give I'll give back some time for the questions. I think this is a huge area because we need to go ahead and understand Bayesian, how the Bayesian works. Uh, there are law uh, and how we can develop neural networks uh, with ba uh, Bayesian neural networks. How can we compute this epistemic and aleatoric uncertainties? How we visualize them and to give you an understanding that um, the classic uh, extracting uncertainties from classification is a little different than uh, you know going ahead and uh, understanding the uncertainties of a um, I would say segmentation. That's that's a little different because you, what happens in segmentation is we go ahead and uh, give a uh, the, the, when uh, let's understand for, the forward pass that happens in classification, the segmentation is not extracted. Okay, uh, the segmentation does not, the uncertainty is not get extracted, but in segmentation that happens, the the uh, the, uh, the the forward pass is the main thing. Now let's understand this. Let's say I have uh, I, I would say a federated deep learning model. So. Yeah, let me explain what is federated deep learning a little bit. Uh, what is a federated deep learning is let's have a model which is the primary model, and then the primary model uh, and there's a secondary or a slave model, I would say. Slave models learns, passes it to the main uh, mother model, and from there the entire features are getting learned. So this is another way of going uh, using federated learning. We reduce this overfitting, and uh, the, 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 this can be used for uncertainty estimation as well. Um, so, so this medical imaging. Uh, one of the things that we are, have to understand that uh, there, there is something called a multi-view. So multi-view uncertainty as well. So what is this multi-view uncertainty? Is let's say I have a uh, view of a heart the view of a heart from this uh, from front plane is not the same on the view of the back plane okay because it, it, the the features are different the so the, the we what we usually do is a 3d model to go ahead and capture the uncertainties this is what i was talking about the 3d uncertainties can we capture so when you place this Let's say we are trying to identify stenosis, okay, somehow, and so we have this. Uh, so, so the stenosis we need to identify using images. We go ahead and find out uncertainties using a 3D view. So that's kind of uncertainties in 3D we can also do. Uh, and uh, so, so I think we shall only there is time. So let me talk about a little bit about unit. So what unit is doing is it's downsampling and upsampling. So this this architecture helps a lot in something called a Bayesian unit uh, segmentation that we do. Useg. So as which I showed you earlier. So Useg is used 
for uh, uh, you know this uncertainty estimations as well as there as i previously mentioned segnet so segnet is not only for medical imaging it, it it's a, it's an open i think the open api is available if you take your images push it to the segnet it will tell you in the image what is the uncertainty areas now once uh, we understand the uncertainty uncertainty and we go ahead and um, get our human in the loop what is the next step that we need to do see one, one, once we go ahead and do and get all these things when the image is there what can be done is using the human in the loop evolve the model increase the predictability of the model so that is what is required in terms of when i say use uncertainty for your benefit um at this point of time i think uh, so, you know deep, giving a deep dive at this uh, it would be very difficult so i would stop at that as i said that you know uh, this is the end of the introduction and uh, for giving you deep dive we have to get into various things like you know uh, elbow as well as, as talking about variational inference in depth uh, the bayesian theorems bayesian estimators uh the, these kind of things we have to get into uh and uh so as i said we just scratch the service and i will give back sometimes and i can take questions if there are any Okay, I don't see any questions, Vishal. So I guess, you know, we're pretty much on time. Do you have any questions from your end? Yeah, did you sending one? Sending one. How is human in loop? Uh, human in a in loop or reward mechanism? Sorry, I didn't get that question. Uh, I've sent it. Yeah, yeah. Check. How is human in the loop reward mechanism? Okay, so this reward mechanism is. Uh, see this 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 human in the loop reward mechanism is mostly we use for reinforcement learning but this human in the loop is as i said is a little different this human is actually a human like you know the experts who are coming in and saying you know this part of the tumor probably or let's uh, is not a tumor it's probably uh, something else so th that's that human in the loop so the what is the if you say what is the reward for this, the reward would be that you know you will have a better prediction, and you, from a business perspective, you are not laying off anybody. You are having people who are who are, who are using and using the expertise of those people, and going ahead and and uh, having a better AI model. So that's the reward. But I I, I understand this reward mechanism. That, that's a almost a different re reinforcement learning. It's there where you can get uh, make a lot of rewards uh, if that is what you meant over here. But from on the only reward that we can get is make our AI, AI much better, predict increase the predictability. What are the challenges with respect to healthcare as AI is uh, approximate? Uh, uh, with respect to healthcare, as AI is ex approximate science. So the see, first challenge that, um, uh, uh, as as I was explaining, that uh, first thing, whom are we developing this AI ML model for? We usually develop either for doctors, either for physicists, radiologists, histopathologists. Uh, especially computer vision I'm talking about. There are other models, uh, other uh, use, use cases as well. But these are the people whom we are using this uh, or the developing this model for. How to go ahead and enable them? And as I said, the solution is human in the loop. So that's one of the biggest challenge. 
Second channel is domain adaptation, which we usually face. Um, I, I was working with one of the US hospitals and uh, they, they did that. They, sh they got this, um, some, some, some company camera was there to do this kind of uh, imaging. And then they shifted to a Siemens camera and the model that they were using uh, was not working. So that's a domain adaptation. That's why I touched upon. And uh, so these are the few challenges. There are other uh, challenges as well. One of the biggest challenges is masking the data. Uh, how can we go ahead and uh, the PHI information, how can we hide that itself? We use artificial intelligence to mask the, uh, the, the, the PHI information. So not many people will be ready to, let's say if I'm a service provider, not a product company, people will hesitate to give the data. Uh, because there will be PHI information. Uh, so these are the major challenges uh, and there, there, there are implementing uh, in, from implementation perspective or technical perspective, there are so many challenges that we usually get. And as I said, models start overfitting and that's the re whole purpose for me to deliver this uh, you know, uh, tech talk is uh, why, how we can reduce overfitting by absorbing or in a, or helping uh, or helping the organization by developing Bayesian uh, models which not overfit or, or doesn't overfit which works better for medical imaging ensemble of networks or Bayesian yeah so as I said ensemble of network is one thing where you let, let's put it in this way if you have good computational power at, from uh, to, in training as well as the inference. See, when I say ensemble, I ensemble networks are pretty big. And second thing, if this ensemble networks are, uh, you cannot deploy it on the edge. So if you are thinking about, about the edge solution, definitely you can go ahead with Bayesian. If you are, and if you want, if you want your model not to overfit Bayesian, if you have good amount of inference power, you can definitely go ahead with ensemble. Ensemble is very, as I said, it approximates Bayesian as well in a certain way. So it depends on your um, need and what you have. Uh, rather than I, I would not recommend until unless we know the use case depending on the use case you can go either of that but you, you know if you want smaller things small things you or you, you want to deploy it quickly don't want too much of trouble go for bayesian uh, if you want uh, those issues of point estimate out of out of uh, the distribution error domain adaptation you can go ahead with bayesian what are the best image segmented techniques here you unit see image segmentation techniques there are various from supervised unsupervised semi-supervised there are various uh, uh not techniques what we have usually used is unit that's very common uh that we have been using um and uh so th th there, there is something called a bayesian residual unit okay so uh, Bayesian residual unit is another uh, unit that you can use when, when I give you a Bayesian flavor of it. BNN is helping for X-ray images. Yeah, see, BNN is a way of doing things. It doesn't matter what type of image you have. So you can go ahead and do it on any images. Doesn't matter if it's a X-ray image, is a non-X-ray image, you can do it. Well, um, companies like Siemens or GE Healthcare uses Bayesian network. Um, th th that's what we have been pushing our leadership to to uh, you, know, uh, you know use it, uh, pushing our data scientists or vision experts to go ahead and develop those models and come up with this Bayesian uh, thing. But let me tell you, it's difficult. You need very good understanding of um a, 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 a background of visual science geometry uh, maths 
uh, matrix multiplication a lot of things are there so you, a person needs good amount of knowledge to develop a bayesian neural uh, new, neural network uh, to tell you that there is something called a, a pymc3 package which can usually uh, companies they use uh, to go ahead and um, you know come up with these bayesian frameworks now there is a drawback to this because this is still on theano i'm not sure it has been done or not but it, it has been migrated or not but the backbone is still on theano not not tensorflow or anything like that so it so as i said for any company uh, if they want a robust uh, solution which is not really a point estimate we we, we offer vision that that's how it is any other questions audience well i am not seeing yeah another one has come Uh, I've sent another one. Yeah. Oh yeah, as I said, you know, the Bayesian neural network has a limitation as, and there is way to overcome uh, that by doing a variational inference. Uh, that's one of the limitations and there are other limitations as well as, and, uh, and good that you told me because this is what, uh, I, you know, that it, it needs a complete deep dive. One of the another drawback, I would say, it's very difficult to go ahead and use this Bayesian because there is something called a mode collapse. So the mode collapse, you I'm not sure if, if anybody's heard of it, but it happens when we train this generative adversarial network. So the same problem happens with Bayesian. And uh, to uh, the so posterior distribution, I already mentioned that there is a, a problem which we can come up with the, because the the, uh, the posterior distribution is intractable, the actual post. So we actually approximate it by using vi so that's one of them. there are others as well see every neural network has its own limitations but it's how it's on us how we come up with solutions and there are solutions available to go ahead and uh, use this uh, use bayesian yeah sure um, so i had that slide uh, here if you want to know more you can definitely get in touch with me uh, official.indrajit.kar at gmail.com or you can send your questions to uh, Vishal and Sales Strat and uh, I can get the answer, I get it answered as well. Uh, so that's that's my contact. Sure. So uh, any final questions or points by Indrajit? Any final questions by audience or any final points by Indrajit? No, okay. So yeah, I'll just wait for the audience to go ahead and see. One last question I've got. So let me move that. Okay. Here it is. How do we practically use a BNN for real world solution for have a normal ResNet like this as the feature extractor and use a BNN as a classifier head? Well, you uh, classifier head as a BNN. How about this that I showed you something that you can go ahead and approximate a BNN. See, uh, this, I'm not sure if this can be done or not. Probably we need to do, uh, we, we can check and we can write a paper on this, not sure. But one of the way is to approximate BNN in real world is as I was covering in my previous uh, slides that you go ahead and, uh, you know, use drop uh, Monte Carlo dropouts or there are, uh, you can go ahead and use a batch normalization, layer normalization. Uh, these are the te uh, techniques that you can actually use to use a change of frequent test model to a uh, Bayesian. So th 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 that's one of the use use case. But see, 
Um, to give you an example, uh, let's say I have a, a, a iPhone and I, ha I, I have a duplicate iPhone. Will the performance be same? Not really. So that, that so that that's that's how it is. Bayesian is Bayesian. Approximation. Well, it might work. It might not work. And uh, to, to frankly tell you, I am not sure about the getting a classifier head that we have to check. I mean, using a full BNN for the entire network might not perform very well. So use BNN only for the classification. No, no, no. So BNNs will definitely, if that is how you are approaching, so that definitely will BNNs will work better than your, uh, you know, neural, uh, the frequentist or a point estimate neural network. So there is no doubt about it. It is that definitely BNNs will work better in classification because you see, understand, you are given a point and over here you are getting a distribution so to go back to the slide yeah here so see this this is your uh, usual so it's as a classification basic classification but over here what you're getting a distribution of weight and what your output is also a distribution so when you get a distribution, it's like you, you the out, out, if you are the overfitting issues out of the distribution issues, those doesn't happen in BNN. So you did not go ahead and uh, you know uh, use full BNN for the entire network and use only uh, and so use only B, uh, so only BNN for classification head. You did not do that. BNN you train the entire BNN. That, that's that's the, that should be your entire goal. You need not mix and match with a, a, a non-BNN model. I'll say in that way. Great. So we are not getting any more questions. Uh, uh, so thanks a lot, Rindriji. That was a very good uh, session on vision networks. So any any final points? by you to our community because we have a lot of people who are interested in medical science there who are trying to make some projects and things like that so any any final points that you want to give as a caution or as a tip for or usage in their project uh, well i i would say it's a very good field and there are various opportunities if you uh, as i said uh, you know if you want to go ahead and uh, collaborate i i have said given my um, you know um, I, I, id and you can go ahead and uh, I think I disconnected. Uh, you can shoot a mail to me and we'll see if time permits we can sit and write papers and i think we already have a very good platform of a cell strat who there are various uh, experienced people and mentors who can help you to go ahead and achieve it so that's the only pointer. Uh, and uh, another thing is, don't restrict yourself just to uh, just to projects which your company gives. Do the projects by yourself. There are various data sets available which you can utilize. Come up with new new ideas. You can come up with your own paper. Submit it. Submit those paper in various forums. So don't just restrict yourself to your company projects. Do it by yourself do something innovative by yourself keep learning that's what i would say great thanks a lot thanks a lot for all the uh, session and tips uh, so thank you audience for joining and thank you Indraji, for your time for giving this session i will uh, take feedback from audience as well as may like to have uh, future webinars as well if your time permits sure thank you. sure thank you thank you vishal for having me Good night all. Good night.